Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to today's Institute Transportation Seminar. Um, my name is Kyle Hagedorn, and I will be introducing and moderating today's seminar. Our PSU seminars uh, have been a tradition since 2000. Uh, these seminars are once again being held live on PSU's campus, located on the ancestral homelands of the Multnomah, Kaklamet, Clackamas, Tumwater, and Watlala, bands of the Chinook, the Tualatin Kulapuya, and many other indigenous nations of the Columbia River. It is important to acknowledge that we are here because of the sacrifices forced on the indigenous ancestors of this place. Remember those communities and to honor their legacy, lives, and descendants. Today, we are pleased to have Peter Koontz presenting on Confessions of a Traffic Engineer, how the MUTCD impacts everything. So hopefully he'll cover everything. So Peter, just a little bit about Peter. Uh, many of you may already know him, but he deserves a, an introduction. Uh, Peter Koontz was recently appointed Interim Traffic System and Operations Group Director. He began working for PBOT in 2009 to build an engineering team that would help Portland remain an innovative multimodal leader delivering solutions that meet the city's policies. He successfully led the 18.5 million citywide LED street lighting retrofit, the single largest energy efficiency project in the city's history. He has also served as an adjunct professor uh, at PSU, teaching graduate level courses in transportation engineering. He is a member of the Bicycle Technical Committee on the National Committee on Uniform Traffic Control Devices and is chair of the Transportation Research Board Committee on Traffic Signal Systems. Peter is active with multiple professional societies, including ITE, uh, the NACTO, and APBP. All right, so just a couple of upcoming events um, to share. So the Portland Indigenous Marketplace will be held at the Native American Student and Community Center here on the PSU campus on June 3rd and 4th. And then also this year marks the 50th annual uh, Delta Park Pow Wow put on by the Bow and Arrow Culture Club on June 16th and 18th at Delta Park in Portland. So if you're here in Portland, um, these are some uh, upcoming events that we wanted to share with folks, community events. Um, and then in the fall, we will re be returning um, as a course. Um, and so we're looking forward to the seminar returning to Fridays beginning uh, fall 2023, and they will be held in room 269 of the Vanport building on the PSU campus. And so a quick overview of the seminar before I turn it over to Peter. You can expect uh, Peter to present for about 40 minutes, and then that will be followed by a Q&A. We will be receiving questions through the Q&A feature on your control panel and we'll ask them at the end of the presentation right here. And for the folks in the room, you are welcome to just raise your hand and we will call on you to ask your questions. If we run out of time, we will give Peter the opportunity to email written responses for any questions left unanswered. Um, also, there is closed captioning uh, if you are uh, viewing this remotely, uh, but you must click on the CC feature. It's not up here, but if, if you're online, there's a CC feature on your control panel where you can view closed captioning. We will be recording today's webinar and it will be available on our website later today, along with the presentation slides. And then finally, if you are tracking professional development hours, this webinar is eligible for one uh, hour of continuing education credit. And so with that, I will hand it over to Peter. Thanks, Al. Appreciate that. Oh, magic's happening. So <laughs> the slides are up. So thanks everybody for coming. Thanks for everybody online. That's a pleasure to be back in the world stage. Just reflecting on this, it's actually my fifth time presenting at World State the Friday, well, what was the Friday seminar, I the third day seminar. Um, so I was, uh, I was thinking about uh, you know, ways in which to make this uh, meaningful and memorable. I think at the time when I was uh, putting this presentation together, or at least the title of the presentation, I was watching everything everywhere all at once. And I was like, wait a minute, there's some similarities between 
you know, that movie and, 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 and how the work that we do with transportation does affect everyone. Everyone is traveling uh, throughout the day now or back to normal or near normal and, and in person more often than not. So that's something that I think as we think about the new addition of MHC, you know, what traffic engineers are faced with, what we can and can't do is, is part of that, that rule book. So I'll go into a little bit of detail on that and then talk about you know, why, why it has been in the news, why it has been on social media, what, and what can we do about it? That's really the hope that I hope to leave you with at the end of the day is, well, what are we doing about it? What are, we, what are, what are the opportunities? So let's talk about uh, you know the, this outline here. Uh, safety is job one. I, I like to assess uh, are we as engineers, are we as transportation professionals doing a good job? Uh, and I had a recent vacation. Actually, just got back uh, on Tuesday, uh, and also I'll talk about that. Uh, I'll, I'll think about that. You know, comparing, contrasting uh, from my vacation, fresh off my vacation. What are we doing a good job? The role of the MHC, that's a big part. Portland has had a, a response to the a new MHC that's going to be coming out. Uh, so I'll go into a little bit of detail. And then I'll give you some specific confessions. You know, what are the specific elements that are really, I think, uh, part of it, it will be, uh, it'll be two acts. The first act will be parts that I still think we maybe are, are true confessions. And then the second part uh, is, is, a, is hopefully the pieces that I feel we've gotten right with traffic signals in Portland. I want to I want to have you push back on that because uh, that's the traffic signals really the big the, the biggest part of my job uh, in the last uh, 13 years to this day. And like I said, last I'll leave you with recommendations for our industry. Okay, so the assessment of how we're doing. So I'll start with Portland uh, and, and we have been within the Vision Zero team at the city of Portland. Uh, we've been tracking fatalities. Uh, by mode um, uh, for, for longer than this uh, graphic provides. But, but this graphic shows you that we have uh, not made as much progress as we had hoped to when we declared uh, ourselves Vision Zero City. And so if I think about safety as our number one job, the results aren't as promising as what we'd hope. And I think what this calls on us to do is to redouble our efforts and keep working on the engineering solutions that address what we know are safety countermeasures that can improve uh, the performance uh, as, it, as it relates to fatalities. And, and I think this is helpful in terms of keeping our eye focused on that. And, and I think safety is, is our number one job. I don't think in my 25 years careers that I can honestly say that it was in year one. That we now have better tools to quantify that and I'll I'll give you some, I think, what I think are truths that, that we should now know as, as, engineer, as the engineering community. We're not alone in, in Portland, so we've made efforts, but the trends are worrisome that we uh, have seen in the U.S. and pedestrian fatalities that the state goes back from 1990 to 2018. You know, we had a, a pretty positive trend, and then, you know, there's a lot of speculation on why uh, in 2010 it took a sharp turn upward. But certainly, if you think about where we are in 2020 and, and even beyond uh, that, that trend, uh, we're at all time high, and that's, that's, that's again cause for concern. And then, um, if you break that down even further, uh, it's pedestrian, bicyclists, other or unknown, you know, that, that so we can, we can really dig into what are the elements, what, what should we be focusing on? Should we be focusing on pedestrian measures, bicycle measures? Uh, what are what are the what are the things that will help us in this regard? And I think we we have we've been very fortunate to have a lot of research from the Federal Highway Administration, uh, from Portland State uh, as a key researcher in the in the in the not only the U.S. but also the world of, of trying to document that. Just a shout out to Nathan McNeil, some of the work on Green Lane. So well done there. Of course, how all your work and sort of collaborating this, and then and then John MacArthur working on e-bikes and things of that nature, which is a very fascinating emerging question that 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 raises several new ideas uh, in in my uh, in, in, in my world as a traffic signal engineer. But now, as we turn to well, okay, so the U.S. isn't doing so well. Who is? Uh, you can quickly look uh, at this map. 
uh, or this graph from, from comparing uh, the US and our, our European Asian colleagues, uh, mostly uh, industrialized nations, uh, wealthier nations here. Uh, so Italy, UK, Japan, Australia, Mexico, and their performance is much better in terms of deaths per 100,000 population. And I dug in a little bit deeper because I was just on vacation. And I was just on vacation in Spain, and I traveled to the Netherlands quite a bit. And so actually on Twitter, I, I looked up the data of what, what has been experienced in, in Spain. Because when I went to Spain uh, this last, uh, last two weeks, I wasn't expecting the level of street transformation that we have been working on in Portland uh, for, for 20 years. Uh, I, what I saw in Spain, I'll show you some pictures. That's, uh, of course, those are fresh off of my iPhone. But Spain has done a lot of street transformation. I have some, some data that I, I pulled from that. But their, their work in this space from 2000, if you compare it to 2000 and 2018, was really outstanding. And you see that downward trend. The Netherlands has done even better. Um, uh, Spain and Spain, or excuse me, uh, Spain is in green, Netherlands in blue. Uh, Spain has done the, the, the big drop has been in Spain. So their work in this space has really been uh, really been in the last 20 years. The other part that I'll just mention uh, is that we also know that there's inequities in traffic crashes. So if I go back again to US crashes, uh, this is interesting data from, from uh, I think it was Washington Post. Uh, was the sort of here? Uh, it's, it's really associated with, with, with education models. Think about less than high school, high school grads, college, college grads. So uh, it's, it's, a, it's a huge, it's a huge departure if you think about the nature of, of the inequity of who dies in car crashes. So not just head bike crashes, but also overall fatalities throughout throughout our system. So we've got the safety side, we've got the inequity side. And that's really the nexus of, of the talk here. How do we get to this? And so I think that's really where, um, as, as, as uh, Pete Buttigieg uh, called out uh, for some change. And, and I think that was uh, picked up on quickly within the, the NACO sphere of, of, of folks saying, well, look, uh, what, is, what is it that we're doing? Why is this federal name so important? Um, and so I, there's a link to that presentation on uh, YouTube. You can, you can uh, look at that. But I think they did a nice job of framing this issue and, and talking about what it is that we're going to do as NACO cities. And this is, uh, you know, if you look at my previous uh, presentations, I'll sprinkle in a little bit of that NACO experience here as a part of this. But this, this, uh, this nice policy piece uh, came out um, from Roll Call. Uh, and it's not a, not a typical, uh, typical website that I go to, but uh, we really talked about traffic command of the fall sleep by, and it really highlighted this issue and this, this conflict when the, when the NBTC NBA came out that we do have a, a bit of, of controversy around what is it that we're going to do uh, as we move forward with this new addition? Is it going to lead us down this path toward paper streets? And I think the answer is still in, uh, in, in, in question. And that's part of my conversation here today with you is, is how the manual is written. And, and Pete Buttigieg, I think, said it very well and said how that manual is written and what it calls for could actually have a lot of consequences in terms of how people get around, in terms of safety, and even in terms of equity. And, and so I'll talk about that, you know, where I think uh, maybe we've gotten it wrong, uh, where we still have some work to do, and where I think we've got it right, and, and how the METC actually helps us in that regard. So, there's some promising points to this, and it's also some, I get words of caution. But if you think about, again, before we started in this you know, complete streets realm, uh, you know, why is the METC notorious? The, 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 the thing that I have found with, with the outcomes from the METC, if you just apply it blindly, then you get the things that Portland Bureau of Transportation has identified as the challenges that we have in a lot of our streets. Uh, especially in East Portland. Um, you know, we have fast moving traffic. The speed limits were set, uh, essentially the all you can eat buffet of, of, of speed limits. So you can go as fast as you want on a very straight roadway and long distance between signals, right? So that's built in an era where maybe we weren't as thoughtful about where traffic signals should go and how 
We expect people to get to, from place to place. We didn't always expect 40 years ago that everyone was going to walk, uh, want to walk or access transit. Perhaps I think this example is 122nd Avenue, which is a, is a very wide arterial with unprotected bike lanes uh, and, and unprotected crossings. Now the city is working to, to amend that and putting a lot of investment into East Berlin now, but we still got a long ways to go. So I think if you apply the MTC plan, this, you can put those stripes down. You don't have to put it street lighting. The MHCC doesn't mention street lighting. Maybe it should if we're trying to get people to yield to one another, trying to get cars to yield to, to cyclists and people walking across the street. But that's part of the challenges. And, and that's, I think, the good news is that engineers aren't just applying this blindly anymore. We know certain things that are helping to move forward. And we've gone past. So this is, anybody know where this is in the audience here? Pioneer. Pioneer Square. So the heart of downtown Portland in 1973 was a parking lot, hmm. right? So we, this is what we did in the 70s. We were accommodating the car. We were thinking about downtown as a as competing with the suburban shopping malls. And so, you know, that the downtown leaders at that time said, wait a minute, that, maybe that's not where we want the cars to be all be. We, we, we then got together and opened that up, the Pioneer Square today that we know uh, is, is, a, is a meeting point for, and we have branded on three sides of the square. And so it's a very multimodal, multimodally rich part of the city. So we, we, we I'd say engineers, especially in Portland, have come a long ways from that 1970s mentality. But if I go to Barcelona, still fresh off my trip, they've done a lot of things that really do make us think differently about where, well, okay, they have had recent success in the 20 years. How, what is driving their experience? And one of the things they've done is a lot of speed limit setting. And when, the, when we talk about 20 is plenty in, in the US, and we don't talk about 20 kilometers per hour, we're talking about 20 miles per hour. So Barcelona has done some 20 kilometer per hour kilometers per hour streets. So very low speed streets. So the expectation that, of course, we know that speed is a huge factor in relation to the potential for someone that's outside of a car that's involved in a crash to, to die. And so you think about that 20 miles an hour, you think that it's about a 20%, 15, 20% chance they will survive that crash. 20 kilometers per hour even gives you a better chance. And so, you know, thinking about this in terms of traffic control, one of the things they've done is they use shares, the shared lane markings for bikes differently than, than we do in, in, the, in the US. Essentially, this was uh, uh, showing that you can go through at the intersection uh, as opposed to just having to lead forth and make the left. And that was transitioning into a left side bike lane, which was very nice, uh, gave you that sort of uh, all ages and abilities. Uh, on the far side of the intersection where you, they have defined space for people walking and biking. And also when I was in Barcelona, I had a chance to do the BC bus, which is uh, their, their safe route to school. And I like to think, I like to talk about that safe route school is basically a safe route school on steroids. They have police that show up and escort the group uh, through the streets of Barcelona. They don't stick to the neighborhood greenways. They are on the main streets. And so they're going through and uh, quirking intersections, getting the students all the way to school, and even taking different routes during different times, different uh, experiences. So again, giving that sort of feel that they can be part of the, the ecosystem of traffic. And if I think about streets in Barcelona, you know, I think about, well, you know, would we build something like this in the US? And the answer is no from a Variety of perspectives, whether it be fire truck access uh, or you know streets having streets be for people. I stumbled upon this al fresco dining club in Barcelona. I mean, talk about a creative use of the streets. You know, they didn't uh, worry too much about uh, uh, a, a visitor coming in and, and uh, snapping a photo of them, enjoying the streets in a different way than what we do today. But we are making progress in that regard. I think if you think about how we use streets, uh, this notion of you know, reclaiming the space is really important. And that's something that Portland's done, I think, a lot of, a lot of good work on this in terms of how we rethink and, and address 
you know, both neighboring greenways, which is this uh, good example of bicycle boulevards for those of you not, maybe not in Portland, uh, using different terminology for different streets, but having street seats, having a, a comfortable space, uh, and then, of course, the creative colors that are used on the, on, on the asphalt. So all that is to say that from a transportation policy standpoint, we're, dry, we're driven with the idea that you know the speed kills, right? So that's a clear, the physics is well established on that. I think that's something that if you haven't heard that before, if you haven't seen the data, I'm happy to share that and link that to you. We also know that climate is a reality, so we're working on that. So always asking that question to the city. Of, uh, is this is the faction going to move us forward from a climate standpoint? Uh, as we've seen, if you think about this notion of transportation demand, uh, the build it, you know, we're price sensitive. So the, if we want um, certain outcomes, we have to price those outcomes. It's a way in which to think about how uh, we, we essentially move forward with some of our with some of our uh, some of our actions. Uh, but we want to do that equitably, and so that's a lot of good work that the city has done on that as well. And then and certainly the reality is the change is hard. So we're moving, we're moving in a, in a course in an ecosystem of the city. The recovery from COVID is still a thing that we're working towards, and any change on any street is, is going to be at some point. So back to the MHC. So all those things are part of the puzzle. Uh, if we think about this nature of, well, what is it as an engineer that I'm dealing with? The MHC is a big part of what drives what we can and can't do. MHC uh, provides us with uh, guidelines, uh, and recommendations, uh, and support statements, and then standards that are things that we're not able to do. Uh, and, and so part of that is at the city we. Uh, thought a lot about this and, and really felt like with the new administration, this is an opportunity to reframe the METC as a proactive safety regulation. I think that was a little bit of an aspirational goal that we, we wrote with some, uh, some, some investment behind the challenge that we've had in terms of getting to the solution that we want. We've had to interpret the METC a lot. Um, and so we were very you're trying to say, well, maybe you should just resend the MK. Maybe it wasn't ready. Um, there's a lot of new information that we hadn't really seen as being active on the National Committee. Uh, so, and it didn't really feel like it was going to reflect the proactive safety approach that we've heard from, from, the, from the Biden administration. Um, we asked for a revised back to basics manual, which is actually, there's a lot of people on the National Committee, I believe, that are, that are pretty, pretty supportive of that sort of idea that and maybe we've gone too far. Maybe it shouldn't be an 860 page document. Maybe it should be something that's a, a lighter lift and it should leave it, it leave a lot of judgment in the hands of the engineer. And then the other thing we called for is increasing the diversity of the people involved. It's a it's it's a, something that we've noticed over time that has gotten uh, a broader range of voices, but we can always do better. And I think that's something that we want to just point out as, as a key feature as we move forward. So the comments and concerns, uh, the idea of rewriting or revising, uh, you know, what are the specific things? Well, the good news is that the METC and the National Committee has done a lot, and the authors of the Federal Highway Administration, they have done a lot of supportive change to meet some of the goals that we have at the city. Uh, speed limits, uh, I was on a working group that really looked quite closely at the 85th percentile rule and, and responded well, and I'll talk a little bit about that. So. It's, I think that National Transportation Safety Board got involved and made recommendations, and we looked at those very carefully. So I applaud the efforts of my colleagues that uh, worked through that as a as a team to come up with new recommendations. You know, but one of the things that I got uh, feedback on in advance of this was uh, signal warrants. People always struggle with this notion of signal warrants, so we'll talk about that. But as signal heads, you wouldn't think that they. You know, we, I think we take them for granted in Portland. We always have them at every intersection. If there, you do find one in the city, you have to let me know because that would be a surprise to me. But we put them in every intersection, but they aren't required in the main of uniform traffic trouble license. So that's a maybe that's something that you could take away and say, gosh, well, I mean, we haven't gotten it completely right. It's going on over here. Hopefully, it's not picked up. And then I know the integration of needs of all users. So 
I'll talk about that as a part of this. Um, more specific concerns, accessibility, uh, that need, need for greater accessibility for all of our uh, all of our customers, uh, so blind and, 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 and wheelchair access. Uh, bike facilities is the starting point. We still have in the new NPA it, a lot of shall statements that say what we can and can't do. And, and really, much, much of that is optional. So you don't have to have bike facilities on any, any one, uh, bike facilities on any one street. And the street line, again, mention that as a something that's just not mentioned and maybe will be an important part of safety as we move forward. This note of the traffic signal heads. So the, the language is the design and operation of traffic control signals shall take into consideration the needs of pedestrians, but pedestrian signals are not always required. And that's because, again, I think a, a missed opportunity where you know, maybe that should be prioritized. Maybe that's a basic level of, of treatment that uh, we, we, we should we should read this, or that FHWA should just say, hey, that's really that's 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 something we should do. Um, NACTO has had quite a Bit of discussion. I think I want to just applaud their work in terms of galvanizing the, the, the city officials uh, are working on this issue. Haven't always been active at the table, uh, but certainly there's a growing awareness that this is an important document that really can get us to that those are our, our local our local agency goals. And, and I think the goals of federal highway administration as well. But there are challenges though. I mean, FHWA does decide what is a traffic control device. They are the author. Of that manual. So we do have to request to experiment if we want to introduce a new traffic control device. And, and I think part of that uh, is that we assume the illustrations are also standards. They're, they're not. Uh, and so that's just a, the application of the MTCD sometimes is it's, uh, it's, it's, it's maybe it's, it's not that it's inappropriate, but it's just that it's, maybe it's a little bit misguided. So that's a key element, I guess, I just thought I'd throw in there as a part of this. And then design for the future. One of the things that uh, you may not know is the new, the new MHCD has a chapter in autonomous vehicles. It's only four pages long, but it is sort of a caution of are we designing for the future we want? And a uh, little, you know, I was in San Francisco recently and saw that uh, numerous uh, autonomous vehicle manufacturers working on this space. Uh, Oregon State's got their star, starfish <laughs> robots that are roaming around campus. Uh, and so, you know, this notion of what sort of autonomous vehicle future we are looking at is, is I think, an interesting question as we go forward. Okay, all that to say, there are confessions. So here are my confessions. I have, again, two acts. Uh, I was at the Scarlet uh, Caglia Cathedral, and so, you know, divine intervention uh, came through, and these are my confessions. First prevention is, you know, there are six parts, six parts. It's, uh, streets and highways, we still think, I still see a lot of streets and highways, um, and that's still, again, part of the cross-sectional elements. Speed limit, uh, accountability, street lighting, no turn on red, we need pedestrian animals. So let me just go through those quickly. So streets and highways, you, you've probably heard this, um, you know, every, every, uh, every town in America has a street that looks like this, uh, Portland certainly does. Um, you know, acknowledge that there are significant safety risks when we add lanes of traffic. I think in my days as a consultant, I did a lot of studies, didn't always identify that there was those safety trade-offs of adding one more lane. The highway capacity mail just said, oh, just add one more lane, you'll fix the traffic, will be, it'll be great, great for the next 20 years, everybody will be happy. The safety side of that is the piece that's always missing. So the use of the highway capacity mail, still a little bit tough to try to capture the safety elements in that document. Speed limit settings. So we've made great progress on this. So NACO has done some really good work and the National Committee has adopted more flexibility. So uh, I wanna thank Oregon Department of Transportation and their work on this. They've done some uh, participation in the National Cooperative Higher Research Program efforts. And then Washington has done some really great work called injury minimization concepts. So think about speed in terms of the speed goes up, there's the potential for injuries to happen. So a really a paradigm shift for us led by our Chamberlain and who's, who's been a speaker here and Domo Chang uh, at, now, at Washington as well. So great, great minds at Washington. They're, I always follow and watch what they're doing on this. We're gonna try to have signals hold people accountable. So automated enforcement um, is an area where we're looking to use that strategically in the city. 
Uh, we believe that gives equitable enforcement, holding people accountable. Um, so we're deploying that with a thought toward where do we do that and how do we do it most equitably. So the team at the city has really done a great job of moving that, moving that contract forward, working through all, all the issues. Um, still some work to be done to meet our goal. Uh, of 40 cameras, both fixed speed and, and red light running total um, by the end of the year. Um, but, but we're working, working hard towards that. Point. Tree light. Oh, it looks like one of my tree lights are upside down. So we got a little, oh, it must be Google Slides moved it. Uh, but that street light probably should be. Uh, <laughs> Um, so I'm thinking about street lighting as a part of this. This is a basic service. Uh, really does improve multiple safety. Higher, you know, it's very hard to yield to someone as I get as I get older. The my eyesight's not quite as good as it used to be as I'm driving down the street. So I tend to go slower. I tend to try to find that pedestrian that's on that corner, and the street lights don't always help me if they're not bright enough. And so thinking about that in terms of advancing equity, making people really feel like they can make. Walking as a part of their trips. No turn on red. This is something that you know we've got some history there. Energy conservation back in the seventies. Uh, we're watching this quite closely in Portland. Uh, and MTC allows requires turn restrictions for specific applications, so supportive in that regard. Um, and, and there's been a lot of good work in San Francisco, DC, and Seattle. Uh, we've got progress on this issue for the city of Portland. You know, we're, we're working towards a, a language that says we're going to assume turn on red restrictions as a starting point for our new designs. And then, of course, we're requiring no turn on red consistent with the MHCC for bike signals, bike boxes. Um, we haven't done it for leading pedestrian intervals, but we're, we're thinking about that. And then we have uh, written about doing that at pedestrian priority areas. So three areas uh, where we, we have already made some effort. And then thinking about it more broadly on every every new project that we bring into the leading pedestrian rules. This is an area where a uh, colleague, uh, former uh, Portland State grad uh, Oliver Smith, uh, has, has been doing uh, really the, the lion's share of the work here. It's my lead pedestrian rules throughout the city. I think we're up to about eighty-five or ninety. We've been asked to add about ten a year, so we've been exceeding that uh, every year with the limited funding that's available. Um, and really doing a nice job of and trying to distribute those as we go through the daily operations. Okay, so traffic signal opportunities. This is where I literally love your feedback on have we done, have you seen the difference? And so six different items there. Uh, one of the one of the work that really think we thought about is you know, a long saying relationship with Sharisha Kathuri. We I think this is from 2015, back when I didn't have all gray hair. Um, but we've been doing research on pedestrians, uh, improving situations for pedestrians. Um, and and Sharisha has been a great partner. Uh, thanks to Portland State for the funding of, of her time and energy working as a, as a close colleague uh, for the city of Portland throughout those many years. And really trying to put that phrase at the top of our heart and really trying to live, live our goals. So if you have complaints about where you've seen pedestrian delay, do let us know. We're happy to help. And this is really consistent with what NACDO has talked about. So um, as, a, as a city employee, helped to uh, contribute to NACDO's urban street design guide. And I think there's a whole other presentation on that. So I don't think I need to cover that too much other than to say there's a lot of work to be done still. It does take a lot of time and energy to get that right. Travis Snow timing, I think, can be the invisible urbanism uh, to help uh, where we maybe can't get all the space that we want for protected bike lanes. And one of my favorite examples, North Williams, uh, where we time the signals for a slower travel speed. So if you're biking up North Williams, especially on an e-bike, I know you can get all the signals. <laughs> Um, protected turns. We're doing protected turns uh, where we need to, of course, commensurate with bike signals, which are required by the MHC. Um, but that's one where I think you know we, we want flexibility, but we also want to have those sorts of things to help us as a part of this. So guidance, to references, in terms of where to put protected turns can be helpful, but it maybe doesn't belong in the MHC. So that's okay that it's lacking. Uh, ultimately, more research is necessary, and how to have a companion document that helps practitioners through these sorts of questions is, is a kind of a, a, a long-standing question. Council of Prioritized People, we've been doing some really fun work on uh, with another PSU grad, Mark Haynes, 
uh, who's uh, worked on, who's working on Hawthorne right now, but also has delivered the division transit project. And that's a, another aspect that I feel like we've gotten right. So if you've ridden division, if you're stuck at a red light, let us know. I bet, well, actually we're testing it right now. So it may be that you get stuck at a red light right now, but next week we'll turn this priority back on and hopefully you'll let us know if it's, it's working. And then lastly, signals that inform and acknowledge cyclists. So again, another uh, project with Sharisha, and then we brought more colleagues on to, to study this further. Uh, David Horowitz on the far, far I guess, far uh, right of the screen, and then uh, Brendan Russo from Northern Arizona University, really trying to expand again, how are our, our new devices, so this is one of our experiments, with the FHU, uh, a countdown signal we got from the Dutch study abroad program that gives cyclists a little bit of indication, counts them down to the when the signal goes green. So a little bit more uh, smarts at the intersection to try to improve comfort. Accessibility, uh, very key for people that are blind. We do a lot of great work with the Oregon Mobility uh, Office. Uh, uh, that, that works with the blind customers. I never want to have to tell someone that's blind that they we can't help them with that audible message. So uh, I know there's a hatred for big buttons in the industry, uh, in, in the in the Agnesy world, but if you're blind, that's an important element that we're going to provide for you. So uh, you don't always have to hit the button. In fact, this message is accessible message only, so you don't have to hit the button, uh, but that's something that, again, uh, we need to think about that. They're not required in the MTSD. And if you think about uh, ADA, the question is, well, should that be more clear? So uh, there are new solutions that are coming online. We're looking at those as a extra option as well. Okay, uh, again, signal warrants. I couldn't uh, stop myself and I had to include signal warrants. This is one of my favorite examples where I think the MHC values vehicles more than pedestrians. So if you look at what it takes to get a traffic signal warranted in the MHC, it only requires 100 cars, but 133 pedestrians in an hour to say yes to a traffic signal. Does that mean we value vehicles more than pedestrians? No, it seems like it. So I think that's one of those areas, again, signal warrants. There's a National Cooperative Higher Research Project that's going to be studying that. So more research is coming. So that's good. And I'll be watching that closely to see. Uh, in Portland, we haven't had this same issue. We've been very uh, uh, lucky to have pedestrian coordinators that can come up with estimates and forecasts for pedestrian and bicycle demand. And so we use those estimates to then say, yes, the signal is warranted because we want to get people across the street. So you'll see that we are more willing to put in a traffic signal. We don't let warrants stop us from doing the right thing. And I think that's a key thing that the engineers can, uh, there is guidance in the manual that says, yeah, you don't just need to satisfy the warrant. This is just a thing that you can look at. So don't let that be the enemy of the good. Okay, uh, uniformity more than innovation. One of the things, I'll just slip through this quick because I know we're running out of time is this idea of where we put traffic signals. Uh, one of the other things from my vacation uh, <laughs> is uh, traffic signal locations. So this example in Barcelona, you look closely, where do you see the traffic signal? You see pedestrian signals, traffic signal there, traffic signal there. The cars are here. So where, what are we missing? What am I, what's, why is this different? Than a North American traffic signal. Okay, so here's the other picture. This is the other side of the intersection. First on a bike, in traffic signal here, pedestrian signal there. What's he, what's missing here? So in Barcelona, we use near side signal. So in the U.S., you would see a far side traffic signal from the other direction. This is a near side signal. So they show cars near side signal. So this is kind of blew my mind because this is not the way we do it in the US. So it's a completely different way of rethinking it. They also only have one traffic signal over the roadway and then all pull mounted. Why, why is that important? Well, it makes traffic signals a lot less expensive because you only have this very light traffic signal you have to hang up in the air. We, we hang up a lot of equipment with signs, Maybe we are overthinking it in our low speed environments in the US. Okay, so what is the high hope uh, as we look to the future? 
Well, I'd love to see a manual of uniform vision zero traffic devices. I was hoping that somebody would fund that research. Uh, maybe, maybe I was hoping that the MHC would become that. It, I'd say it isn't, so maybe the 12th edition will do that. So to conclude, a lot, there's a lot to think about. Hopefully, you have some takeaways. Hopefully, you have questions. Hopefully, there's some thoughts and ideas from the chat, uh, from the Q&A. My recommendation for the engineering community is we've done a lot of good work, but we haven't met our safety goals uh, of reducing crashes. We've got more work to do on that. So one of the strategies is strengthen ties to research programs and encourage innovation with cities. So one of the things that I'd say as cities, we don't do research. State DOTs are generally the ones that are doing the research. Now, I've kind of, I've kind of violated that, what I just said, because Portland is investing in research uh, selectively on projects where we can build that into our project. So uh, the, the countdown timer analysis that's been done, that was all part of the NATO part of the project. So good project managers say, if you see the value of research. So one of the ideas for a federal administration is integration of research into bipartisan infrastructure, infrastructure log grants. Build stronger city to city consortium, working on technical topics, and encourage stronger partnerships with the University Transportation Center. So that's a key element. Uh, we were very lucky to have Portland State to have a University Transportation Center uh, for a very long time. I'm hoping there's an opportunity to rekindle that in the future with that should be a special plug for the Federal Administration viewers are watching. Finally, reconsider an urban version of the MTC. There was a discussion about that a while back. Uh, uh, I actually, at the time, said, oh, I don't think that's a good idea. Let's just have one manual. As a city practitioner now, I see the value in that. I see it's pretty different, and we need different ideas for those speech considerations. And then finally, adopting proven countermeasures and actions from countries that are achieving possible. So Spain, put on your list. Uh, hopefully the Netherlands and Denmark are also on your list, because those are uh, both, two, both three countries that have done a lot of great work in this space. That's probably it. This discussion. Yeah, thank you, Peter. There are quite a few questions online. Becca, if I stand here, can you still hear me? Okay, great. Because I think, I think I need my computer for this. So, first question from your colleague, Roger Geller How do fatality rates by country correlate with per capita auto ownership in those countries? So, that is in reference to one of your earlier slides when you're talking about fatality rates. Oh, that's a great question. I don't, I don't, I don't know the answer to that. I have to look that up. Um, there was a comment on your sideways photo. Oh no! <laughs> so one of the one of the attendees mentioned that the location for the street map was blocking view of the pedestrian and sight line of the auto. Her comment was that LPS needs to be accessible and transportation costs to be useful. Bill, you want to answer that one? <laughs> Not my district. It was just a comment. I can move on. Okay, so the next question is Is there a new requirement to add street lighting uh, to lamps with any uh, new? pedestrian crosswalks installed. So for example, in Vancouver, Washington, they had a project and now the street is overlit. There seems to be little balance, if any balance, in lighting versus safety. So any thoughts on that? Hmm. Yeah, we have uh, we have a requirement with a new mark crosswalk to make sure that we assess lighting and, and try to uh, make sure that the new crosswalk or any innovative traffic control treatment would be it would be lit so that if you're going to do a bike box or some other you know, car crosswalk, but there would be lighting there. Um, the new lighting standards, I, I, I do, there is a, a part of me that says that we've overdone it with lighting standards, depending on the, if you use the IES standard. Um, we have our own lighting standards that are, I'd say, um, less well lit. Um, so yeah, I'm happy to follow up. And our lighting standards are in our PED PDX plans. We did that as a part of the had a pedestrian plan, so um, that's available online. And following up on that, this is an interesting question too. So I know this audience loves lighting. So, um, so this person said, I just read something from Xerxes, uh, invertebrate um, conservation. 
about the huge bleed of LED lighting interfering with the lives of many small creatures. Do we keep our streetlights hooded enough to not bleed light when we don't need or want it? Yeah, we, uh, so our cover head lights, that's, that's not that, but the cover head lights are, are zero up light. Um, this uh, pedestrian scale lighting is an issue with some of our pedestrian scale lighting where there is a bit of up, up lighting. Um, we are sensitive to the, you know, the, the environmental aspects of lighting. And so that's why we haven't gone to the, the GAIAS standard, which is a lot brighter than what we, we use in Portland. Mm -hmm. Do we have any questions in the audience? There are quite a few online, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, what about um, research on signage? Um, I've read in the Atlantic and uh, journal articles that the uh, standard uh, warning signage in, that we use in the U.S. does not change driver behavior, but the more dynamic rock'em sock'em signage uh, used in Europe uh, does change driver behavior. And we move in that direction. Yeah, we have uh, uh, the no turn on red. Uh, we've had some great success with the active warning signs, where we uh, actually it's active regulatory signs, where we we, we do bring up a no turn on red when a bike uh, signal is present. So we we use those selectively because they are more expensive than a static sign. Um, so we're always looking for ways in which to make the signs uh, more effective. Um, but there is, uh, you know, the earlier argument that if sign clutter is a problem, that's an area where I think more research is necessary is looking at, you know, do people have the ability to pick up on all the messages that we're trying to send them? Let, let me clarify um, uh, the imagery, not the sign. For example, the new uh, light rail versus bike sign. Uh, uh, yes, I, I'm aware of that one, yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's pretty, that looks like it would be pretty effective. And what's the status of that new sign? Is it official? Uh, that's been in our, uh, in our PBOT standard for I think 15, 20 years, ever since Streetcar was first introduced, or not first introduced, but after Streetcar was introduced, we had a lot of crashes. That's really a mitigation for some of the bike. Right rail crashes so that's a that's an area where yeah certainly um could we make those more effective i think we look at the safety where we can invest in safety and and and, and we try to strive towards systemic improvements and also actions uh, where we've seen crashes to try to strike that right balance and that's that's definitely an art that we um, the highway safety improvement program through ODOT has helped us with quite a bit and we so we're always looking to try to make sure we're getting the best bang for our buck with cars and I think Nathan had yeah. a hand up. Um, so your chart of the safety improvement in Spain was uh, pretty astounding. And I guess just since you're freshly back from there, can you go into a little bit more detail on what, what you think the major transformation was that was there? Yeah, I, I did a little digging. Um, they have done a significant amount of work on, um, on, on transforming streets. And carving out space for cyclists um, in Spain, I think in 1990, I think the the number was they had 10 kilometers of bike lanes, and in 20, the last time it was reported, it was like 250 kilometers, um, and a lot of work on speed control that really makes those other streets that aren't don't have you know dedicated space much more comfortable um, for people that are cycling. So I, I think that's you know this the speed is a huge issue. Yeah. And then space. I mean, they zebra is from there. I visited them, and you know they have those those armadillos or zebras, I guess they call them. Somebody else has armadillos, but the the making a physical delineation of space is really, I think, a, a big part of that. And then you know, so you see that arm science where we're striving towards protected bike lanes more than than, than the normal, and you'll see that on Southwest Fourth and our our, uh, our work there. You've seen that on NATO Parkway. So that's part of the puzzle is you know creating space and then you know, obviously with the signals creating time as well. I think they look more like really polite. Really polite. Really polite. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going to ask a couple of questions online and come back to you, Cameron. 
So what is the outlook for the National Committee uh, establishing a pedestrian-specific technical committee? Oh, great the question. Current, the current task force does not seem to fall much weight. Well, the task force has got a uh, new uh, new energy, uh, Randy McCourt. Uh, you may know him. He's the task force chair. Uh, he's doing a great job of pulling a lot of different information together. Uh, the interesting part that's happening in the National Committee is that task force now can uh, make recommendations for the manual and changes. Um, so that's new. That's kind of a, a exciting avenue for pedestrian innovation to get into the manual. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm bullish on uh, pedestrian act activity uh, increasing. Uh, we saw a lot of activity uh, ever since I've been involved with bicycle request to experiments from across the nation. So um, I think you're going to see us. I mean, it really does, it is driven by volunteers. And so if you're a city professional or even a state professional, for that matter, that's excited about that, you know, do come to the meeting and, and, and get, get involved. And I think similarly, there is a question on here um, regarding accessibility. Do you see opportunities to improve things and engage disabled community members beyond just what is required by the law? Yeah, I think, I mean, we we uh, we try to make it a, a point to, we get requests to respond, you know, very, very, it's very short or not. Think about somebody that's blind, that's, that's, that's you know, one of the most vulnerable people uh, just because uh, the, the challenge of crossing the street and, and a traffic signal, I, I just, you know, I've, I've been in those training sessions where you're blindfolded and, you know, that's, if you haven't done that, you should, um, or get in a wheelchair. And, and do the same. It's it's tough, and so that's that's where I want to you know that's that's uh, that's a it's a key aspect of our work. And you think about safety, that's uh, that rises right to the top. But we haven't done a good job of documenting that and the benefits and the challenges of the blind community uh, in, our, in our profession. Cameron, why don't you go with your question? Yeah, so I know Peabody Kudas the envelope of traffic control devices. There's been tensions at time with the request to experiment process at FHWA. I'm curious if you can speak, um, you know, to Peabot's kind of typical interactions with that process, um, workarounds that you may have found, and whether you expect any changes to that process in the near future. Um, that was a lot. Uh, we, yeah, we, we, you know, we, I, when I joined the city in 2009, we had an active request to experiment on pedestrian hybrid beacons. Um, you know, I, I'm, always, I'm always clear if it's still open or not. Uh, it's one of those where. You know, maybe I haven't done as good a job as I need to to you know, clarify what we've been doing, and uh, and and I think vice versa. FHWA, the METC team is, I think it's seven people. It's not a massive operation, and I, I would just encourage FHWA to, you know, spend more on that program certainly to help to you know get more information on some of these things, and then even you know. Tie in again some of the opportunities that we have to do innovation uh, with grants to really make change happen, um, so that we are getting the best ideas from you know from the implementers on the street. I think and, and incorporate research so we're kind of continually learning about about those those new ideas. Um, I think recently, I mean, we've had we have probably three or four requests to experiments in right now. We've been very fortunate to work with Portland State and Oregon State on, on these, um, depending on capacity of staff um, and, and the capacity of city as well, because it does take time to do that work and make sure that it's uh, documented. Um, so I think it's been uh, I think it's been good. I always love a little more opportunity. I think uh, this, the process is a little bit closed. Um, so pairing up with cities that are Doing the same request experiment would be fantastic, um, and that's that's one where I don't know um, all the reasons behind the way the request experiment uh, process happens, but I think we could do we could do more to collaborate amongst our peers. So we have just a few more minutes and a few more questions. So um, I know this next question probably uh, warrants a whole. Uh, separate seminar or webinar, but just what are your thoughts on um, what performance measures or metrics are both feasible to measure and convincing on value of changes 
to balance the needs of all road users to shift away from driver speed, wait time, as the old standard. So Kilson just did an NCHRP project that looked at that. They I'm trying to remember the number, but they presented on a TRB. Um, um, I, I'll definitely, I can, I can definitely link to that. I, I've tweeted about it. If you look at my Twitter timeline in January, I was super excited about it. I think I even heard about it last year as well. Um, that's you know, moving away from the level of service uh, is, I think, a first step because that's, you know, my first 10 years of my career were all about making sure the car delay was not higher than 80 seconds per vehicle. Um, I presented on that, I think, in 2012. My first first presentation called Confession for the Traffic Chair was talking about mobile service and how, how we had done that work uh, for agencies across the U.S. Um, and so level service is definitely, I think, it's still with us. We're still using it, uh, but it's not our sole measure. Safety is definitely our, our North Star. So that's, that's I think, where we've made significant progress. Um, but when, depending on, you know, which project you're working on, you may see differences of opinion on that and how much safety trumps, uh, you know, the, the idea of wider wider roadways. This is an interesting question. I'm just curious about your perspective on this. How might the MUTCD help with the problem of enormous of the enormous size of new vehicles causing such poor sight lines to drivers, to persons in the walk crosswalk and being very vulnerable users? More of a NHTSA question. National Highway Tra Traffic Safety Administration, they've kind of got the, the MUTCD. I've heard a lot of administration is more about the infrastructure side than the person. And then last question online, um, here, on the climate subject, any chance on new guidance on street trees? Oh, street trees. Um, street trees are, you know, it can be a significant challenge for it because they, you know, it's that notion of where do they fit and, and how do they disrupt sidewalks? And so that, that's, that's certainly something that uh, we, you know, our urban forestry department, we work quite closely with them. Um, should they have a significant mission to deliver street trees and we want to help them with that, but it's it's hard and we have a limited space. And so we're, we're continuing to work to make sure that we can meet the MHC and meet that goal of additional urban forestry. I missed a couple of questions. So what is, and last, last but not least, how about this? Um, what is the latest uh, time frame for the new MHC? I wish I knew. Uh, the deadline was May 15th. Uh, I think that's right, May 15th, but you know, we can always meet our deadline. <laughs> um, that was 18, you know, so 18 month process. So the rulemaking, um, I think it's just hard to write a document that meets all the goals of the current administration uh, published underneath a different administration. So that's, that's I think, um, they're still working on those comments. There were, you know, I think over 20,000 comments, which is unprecedented. So I think, mm -hmm. um, you know, trying to rectify that and look at the new research and figure that out. So, uh, so yeah, I, I, I honestly don't know. And I, uh, we are meeting, the National Committee is meeting in June, um, last week in June in Tacoma. Um, so we will maybe know more before that, but maybe not. Okay. Okay, I guess there is one more question, and it's a quick one, I think. So, and then we'll wrap it up. Is Portland typically installing right turn on right restrictions in locations where LPI are implemented? No, we haven't. We haven't uh, required that. I think ODOT has asked us that on a couple occasions. Um, we haven't. Um, we haven't always required that. It's something that's been an active conversation whether we should or not. Um, so I don't have a great, I don't have, I don't, I don't have to fit it. We do it as a case by case project process. So I think the answer is possibly. If there's an area where you think we should have one, I think I'll have and happy to entertain that. So lots of good questions, great presentation. Let's thank Peter for the time.